Welcome to this family, family Bible study hour. It's good to see you. We're going to get into our Father's Word and get back into the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah meaning in the Hebrew tongue, the one whom God launches forth. That means with vigor, with power. As a matter of fact, if you remember, he said, I place you over all governments, peoples, kings, priests. Jeremiah was chosen by God even before he entered the mother's womb. As we complete the second chapter, remember this. God stated, my people have committed two evils. Now to understand the chapter 2 and even into 3, you must remember what those two evils are whereby you can fix the analogies that God is utilizing to bring forth his feelings toward his children. Those two evils were this. Number one, they turned away from God. And number two, the next evil was that they created gods of their own or religions of their own to save themselves. Their own methods of salvation rather than as it is written in the word of God. So anytime that, um, that you leave your, uh, your father that is apostasy. Apostasy is when you believe in the living God and then turn to something else. So naturally, you scholars and students must realize that when God is speaking here of the children turning away from him, he's talking about apostasy. And all the apostasies that took place before the great apostasy, which is when the false messiah appears on this earth, are simply types leading up to that event. Don't ever forget that. And, and our Father's word will fall in place much better for you. He said, I've, um, and, and we had gone to the 31st uh, verse. He said, have I been a wilderness to you? A wilderness where there is nothing that is tangible or uh, of... Um, uh, high tech or anything of that nature, no knowledge for, uh, pouring forth, a land of darkness, that means not darkness, God has been light to the children. He led them, fed them, cared for them, and um, the pulling away from the Lord was on their part, and he states in the closing sentence of that 31st verse, a land of darkness, wherefore, say my people, we are lords, we will come no more unto thee. In other words, they had turned away, apostatized themselves, and, and uh, they have, they, in the Hebrew, we have dominion of our own salvation. My friend, there's only one Savior. Think about it. Now, with a word of wisdom from our Father, verse 32, let's pick it up and go with it. Can a maid forget her ornaments? Or a bride, her attire. Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. And quite frankly, my friends, this generation is a good example of that. What he's saying here, and he's referring and using the analogy of, of Israel being his bride, how that when he took her, she does, a bride will always remember her wedding dress. A bride will always know what she was wearing and how her hair was fixed. And so I said, you don't remember that. You don't remember back the good times when everything was really rough for you and I took care of you. You seem to forget that and, um, and have turned away. Now, now we have a bit of a law that is coming into this because the law of marriage. God is using that analogy and naturally you must understand the law of the marriage, this is to say before Christ, that if, if a woman was married and her husband and her divorced, I'm only using the feminine, it applies to both parties, male and female. I'm using the feminine because Israel is feminine. Then we see within that, that she was not free to apostatize or turn away from her husband and then want him back. That's against the law. Once you turn away from him and divorce him, 
and, and uh, take someone else, which they had in false religions, you're not free to go back and take that man again. That will be the analogy that he will be building to. I lay the groundwork for it, whereby you can better understand. So you don't remember, I, I've taken care of you, but you don't remember even those very good times that most people would never forget. And if you look around yourself today, how often is our Heavenly Father spoken of in most communities in the respect of community publications or thoughts? It's like, it's worse than Sodom and Gomorrah in many places as far as God being thought of or remembered. They live from day to day in fear of each other, basically. It's real sad. They don't remember the Creator is their Father and that He loves them. And there's always hope in Him. Naturally, I hasten to add that when Christ died on the cross and brought in salvation, we're free to remarry into the kingdom of God through salvation. Got it? Okay, verse 33. Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? You know what the way is? Why do you lay out here um, uh, plotting and laying beside the road to play the harlot? All right, to every man that comes along. Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. In other words, um, a professional harlot could take lessons from you. That's what he's saying in a spiritual sense. Understand, we're talking about not adultery actually, but idolatry. That is to say, God's children turning away from him their hearts and minds not going back to him, that love uh, that was held for God when he had saved their necks, but they continue drifting further away. And, and we could probably use the same analogy in reverse by saying a Baal priest could learn from you because of your own self-religion and systems and denominations whereby very seldom is the word of God even taught there. It's saying the same thing. That's what God's point, all right? That you go out and you um, uh, trimmest, you plot and uh, to seek that love. Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways, meaning you could teach the professionals, 34. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls, not bodies, my friend, eternal souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. In other words, I don't have to dig around and investigate to find this out. You do it openly. And unfortunately, many innocents are drawn in by false teachings, by false leadership in, in religious systems. When God's word being taught is left away from your place of worship and study, you're suffering, my friend, and you are in dire danger of deceiving yourselves and trying to come up with that that saves a soul to the innocent, meaning the lay person that doesn't know any better. So be very careful, very careful in how that you study our Father's Word, whereby you know how to help people, how to lead people, whereby they can find the way and the love of our Heavenly Father. Verse 35, yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. In other words, God saying, behold, I will, that word plead would be better translated judged. I will judge you because you say you have not sinned. In other words, many times people can work because a, a, a majority will say, yes, that is true. That is gospel when it's not even in the word of God. We have prime examples of that in churches throughout the land. I didn't say all of them, but many, many of them and certain of all denominations and all religions that will feel they're totally innocent because they feel really what they're doing is right up to snuff. 
I'll use the word snuff, right up to, right up to par. And they think they're totally all right in God's eyes, and they probably never crack the Bible. They probably never check out what God hath said. As long as the denomination and the majority will approve of it, it doesn't matter whether it's written in God's Word or not. And you drift and drift and drift, and soon you're off course. It happens every day. And those that are swallowed up in that, but what God says is it doesn't matter whether you're innocent or not. When you say you haven't, I will judge you. And naturally, God is judge. Verse 36. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? In other words, you flirt and gaddest about and primp and try to change your way, that is to say to move away from God, apostasy, into some religion. Thou also shalt be ashamed of Egypt as thou was ashamed of Assyria. And here we, we come down to the, uh, the baseline or the prime line and what, uh, what our father wants to say. The, the Assyrians basically took the ten tribes of Israel, the house of Israel, and of course uh, Nebuchadnezzar would naturally take Judah, but also they would all go down to Egypt at one time and look for Egypt as a savior rather than trusting God. The same thing will happen again in this book of Jeremiah. You will see several wanting to always run to Egypt. They're strong and they'll protect us. What he's saying is, is they won't help you. You're, gonna, you're going to still if you leave me and try to wed them in this analogy that he's using, um, then they won't have you. You flirt or cheapen yourself by changing your ways. Think about it, friend. How often have you read your father's word to check other men's sayings and teachings out? Think about it. Wrestle with it. Verse 37. Yea, thou shalt go forth from him and thine hands upon thine head. That's in shame. For the Lord hath rejected thy confidences, and thou shalt not prosper in them. When you start trying to dig your own cistern and preserve for yourself your own water rather than accepting the fountain of the living waters, that is to say, when you apostatize yourself and turn away from the Word of God and God's teachings and try to bury yourself in some religious ceremony, be careful, friend. God won't prosper it. He won't answer your prayers. And uh, he'll not bless you. And someday, you're going to be very, very ashamed. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when the true Messiah returns to this earth because of the deception that reeks throughout the world, even at this time. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Thought continuing now. They say if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? The law says no, no way. Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, not just one, many lovers, Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. In other words, the Lord is saying, I'll take you back. I will take you back if you'll turn to me. And of course, with Christ, have, as, as stated within this analogy, with Christ having died on the cross, that as soon as the husband is dead, the bride is free to remarry. Naturally, the resurrected Christ she is free to participate in that wedding. So that gives the entire analogy. But God said, though you've done this, I will take you back. I will ask you to come back. And it is well and good in God's eyes. If, um, for example, let's take it in, down to the bottom line today. In, in this same case, if a woman ever 
loved or felt led and her first husband had loved her did love her did still love her and they wished to go back together of equal consent or thereby near then by both repenting before Christ they're free to remarry I know that many churchmen unfortunately in church systems hang people up on marriage if I did not believe that Christ could forgive any sin even that of divorce one or two times Christ forgave the woman at the well who had lived with five, four husbands and was not married to the man she was living with then. And he forgave her and used her to even bring people into the glory of God. So Christ is able. And don't ever let some individual, I don't care what rank he thinks he carries or she, Christ is able to forgive all but one sin and divorce isn't it. All right, so the stage set, verse 2, let's go with it. Not only did God say, I would take you back, he's asking that she come back. Verse 2, lift up thine eyes into the high places and see where thou hast not been laying with. In the ways hast thou set for them, playing the prostitute by the wayside, the road, as the Arabian in the wilderness, uh, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Uh, and of course, the great apostasy of all brings about this greatest whoredom of all. When people rush to this spurious Jesus, when he returns performing miracles, when they have been led to believe by the system that they won't be here, they're going to be deceived, the innocents. It is a sad time because the truth has not fell upon them and they still will grab the first supernatural entity that sets foot on this earth claiming to fly them away. They're ready. They're hot to trot. Yet it is not written in God's word. I know that angers some. Be that as it may, I say it in love. Verse 3. Therefore, the showers have been withholden. What's that? The latter rain. The truth of God's word has been held up. If people like to deceive themselves, God will let them. The latter, therefore, the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. You don't even... Know what you're doing is wrong, is what he's saying. That's why you think you're all right. I'm saved, but I'll still worship the first Jesus that appears, that is able to promise me in a supernatural sense he's going to fly me out of here. Well, there's one coming, friend, and he's going to do exactly that. And Christ would tell you in Mark 13, have you ever read it? If they tell you he's in the desert, if they tell you he's in Jerusalem or here, don't believe it because he's a fake. That's very biblical, my friend. Have you been taught, has the latter day rain fallen on your mind, whereby you are skilled in the word of God? Verse four, will thou not from this time cry unto me, my father, thou art the guide of my youth? When that happens, are you gonna turn back then again to me and say, I'm your friend from your youth? when you've been laying out here with all these others? Verse 5. Will he reserve his anger forever? Is he ever going to get mad? Will he keep it to the end? Question. Behold, thou hast forsaken and done evil things as thou couldst. In other words, you have done it over and over and over. But do you know something? God still asks you back. Verse 6. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah, the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. In other words, 
Anytime they go on a new mountain, they'll believe anything anybody tells them. Now, who is he talking about here? He's talk, you're going to see a split in this chapter, n not an actual split happening, but you're going to hear the house of Israel spoken of separately from the house of Judah. Why? They are two separate houses in this sense. All are the children of Jacob. But there are two houses from this time until they're joined into one stick at the very time just before Christ returns. They are still two separate houses, the house of Judah and the house of Israel. He's talking about, in other words, the ten tribes that went north with the Assyrian. So they're up there, they're spread out, and they would ultimately go over the Caucasus Mountains, settling in Europe, and many coming later to Amer the Americas, this hemisphere. They don't even know who they are out there braying like wild asses in the wind, not knowing who they are and the fact that they are that house, a promise to Abraham that they would become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. But Judah was the king line. That's what he's going to be building around. They should know better. He said, have you seen what Israel, the house of Israel, is doing. They'll believe anything anyone tells them. Verse 7. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. I'll take you back. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. In other words, the house of Judah saw it, the king line. And what did they do? Verse 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed, committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. I divorced her. Yet her treacherous sister Judah, that's to say the house of Judah, feared not, but went and played the harlot also, taking on other religions and beliefs rather than and with apostasy, with Judah being the king line, where leadership is supposed to stem forth, she also was deceived. She also went astray. Verse 9, And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom I want you to check out that word lightness in the Hebrew. Yeah, I want you to do it on your own. You should have a strong concordance, and you'll find out it became famous, not lightly, as we might use lightly in the English tongue today. That she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And here you have the prime root again of the analogy. In other words, it was not whoredoms in the sense of that that is sexual, but that love and the belief and the love of God and that he should be your God and you should place no other religion or belief before him. He said, you go out and you commit these things and build your own little houses and pick up systems and customs and traditions of men and my word is not taught there. That's what he's saying. And hey, I got news for you, friend. It still goes on to this day. Verse 10. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord, falsely, she faked it, in other words. She fakes her love for me. Doesn't really do it. It's a falsehood. It's obvious that our father is not too happy with his children, and that is why his wrath will build. And that's why as the latter rain does continue to fall on the remnant that is supposed to hear, those people that have eyes to see and ears to hear, as the latter rain does fall upon their minds and they develop into mature children of the living God and followers of Christ, that is to say Christians that they should be, listening to our Father rather than some call to the wayside and participating in some religion, 
Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. It's in everyday life. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto me, The black backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. In other words, Judah should have known better. The house of Judah should have known better. Because the house of Israel, they don't even know who they are any longer. Very few do. Nor do they understand. Nor do they care. That's probably the, the worst. They don't Just get me by from one day to the next. I don't care what happens to the people. Well, certain people do. It's very important. They dedicate their lives to seeing that that house of Israel shape herself up and be in a position whereby as that tender latter rain falls on the minds of those innocent children, whatever age they are, that uh, they come back. But he said here, he said, it's worse for Judah, as bad as Israel was, it was, it's the house of Israel, those 10 tribes that went north in the Assyrian captivity, and that goes back to the 36th verse of the prior chapter, identifying his exact subject in the analogy. Then Judah is worse because she knew better. All right? Verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Our Father is so loving that after he has, in the analogy of a husband, has been treated in this way, he says, come on home. I love you. I'll forget. And you'll have plenty forever. And our Father is exactly that way. He drew, truly does love his children. And there is forgiveness there in his heart. Uh, though he knows man can hardly do this, there, thus the law of, um, of um, in the book of Deuteronomy 24, chapter 24, thus the law that man couldn't do it, but God said, I can do it, I can cut it, I can forgive you. Verse 13, only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. In other words, what is that, what is that bottom line on that, the thought? Ask him for forgiveness, which means you must repent. If you don't repent, he's not going to forgive you, nor is he going to bless you. Well, I don't want God to know what I've done, the sins I have committed. Don't be foolish. He already does. He knows all about you. You're not breaking any new ground in confessing to God. I didn't say man. Confessing to God and asking his forgiveness he has already promised you that he will forgive, that he will take you back. But first, you must admit you're not innocent. Oh, how innocent are we that we all fall short and there is none innocent among us except he that walked this earth almost 2,000 years ago. He was innocent. And yet he will pay for our uh, sins because we're not. We always fall short. We always fall away, unfortunately. But praise be to God. When you repent, he says, come on home, child. Come on home. I will, I will take care of you, and God will. He'll bless you. Things will start. Your whole life will make a change. Your whole life will be turned into a prosperous, more collective life, meaningful, and you'll be a help to others as well as yourself and your own family when you have God's blessings. 
The only requirement he had in that 13th verse, admit you're wrong, admit what you have done, meaning repent. Verse 14, turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. Did you hear that? I am married unto you, and I will take you, one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. I will restore everything. And of course, again, uh, for the sake of those that might not be following the full analogy, I, I must reiterate again. He is speaking of the two evils carried back from chapter 2 that this people had committed, that he was angry about. The subject has continued on to this point of those two evils. And the evil is breaking the first commandment, which is to put some other belief or God before the living God. False religion will do that to you, even if you call it Christianity. If it's false, it's false. That's flirting with the um, evil one. When you falsely um, lead your, allow yourself to be led away from the living God. In other words, to worship a system more than the Creator is a very dangerous thing, and it is so easy. Though by nature we are a people that like to take uh, pride in what we do in, in serving God. If you're not careful and you don't realize it may be the organization you begin to worship rather than God himself because you feel the organization is your salvation other than Christ and there is not a living established organization of any name that can save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. Only God's Word can save you. Man cannot save you. Only Christ. Return to the Father, for He loves you mightily. And within Him, I don't care what you've done, when you repent, He says, come on home. I'll take you back. We're married. And when you love Him, he feels that you are in that sense. I want to go one more verse here. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. In other words, I will send pastors, but they will be in the sense of this latter reign, that truth of the latter days, which will feed you with the knowledge an understanding of what? How to play the harlot? God forbid. Naturally not. But how to study the living word of God, whereby you are welcomed back home and are blessed. Sometimes you have to be very bold, and sometimes you have to offend people to jar their little old Christian boat if it's sailing off into the deep waters of deception, and it offends them, but do it yet with love that they can turn the thing around and before it sinks, caulk it with the knowledge and the truth of God whereby they are not deceived in these latter times. For certainly that time is coming. And even now as, it, as the, the one world system is rearing its ugly head around the world, though it is God's plan, it is coming. It is closer to the door than many might think with, uh, with NAFTA and many other things. Bringing in this peace, peace, peace agreement worldwide. Paving the way for the deception. Your Father's Word warns you in detail about it. The Father promises if you seek, He will sit. Do you know what a pastor is? A pastor is one that tends the pasture. That's where sheep, sheep or cattle graze. God says, I'm going to send you a pasture tender that will make sure that you get plenty of tall, lush, green legumes, grass, that you will be fed well from my word. If you turn to God 
and ask him to open your eyes after you have repented, admitting your sin, not to man necessarily. I don't want to hear about your sins. I want you to let God know and ask his forgiveness. And then he says, I don't want to hear about it anymore. It's over. When you repent, those sins are not even brought up on judgment day. And don't you ever let anybody tell you otherwise. It's done. It's gone. It's so easy to have a clean card by repentance. Your father loves you. He really loves you because he said, after all these things you've done, I still want you. And it, to feel wanted is the center of desire for every human being. They want to be wanted. He wants you. He loves you. Let him know today, won't you, that you love him? Repent and let him know that you want to come home as part of that married wife. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please?